Welcome, welcome. Let's say, yeah, yeah, we've got sound, we're looking good, and we've got folks joining in. Fantastic. We've got Brittany, and I saw Jay. Yeah, I see Jay. I see Tyler. So, oh, yeah, yeah, we're getting folks joining in. So, welcome. This is our official last official live stream. Now, we're going to be doing more over the next couple of weeks to set you up for the final and all that sort of stuff, but I will cover that more at the end of, of the lecture and so forth. Um, we're going to just go ahead and jump into this, and yeah, we're almost at the end of this stuff, right? Hey, by the way, and I'll say this at the end again, Summer registration is still open if you need any classes, but fall registration has just come open. So if you have specific times, specific uh, classes, specific professors that you want to get in on, especially for fall, register right away whenever your time slot comes up. So in the next day or two, you want to be in there registering because a lot of classes fill up within like the first week or two. So don't wait. Okay, so with that, we're gonna, eh, it's kind of cool that we're ending with this particular module because we are now fully in modern times. Now, even though the reading isn't modern, I don't care. We're going to make this really, really, really modern, okay? And we're going to actually talk about things that really matter to you guys today and going into the future, 
All right. So with that, I'm going to start with this. Let me show you this thing. I've got two charts to show you. This is the first of two. Kind of funny how that works. Um, this is the stock price of Intel Corporation between 1994 and 2005. Uh, it hasn't really changed much in the last 20 years uh, from from what you see right now. If you pulled up modern, the, the stock price of Intel today, it's more or less what you'd see over there toward the end. Um, now, you might think that that red line marks when it was at its height. And it sort of kind of does, right? That red line there. That's not what the red line marks, my friends. That red line marks the day I was hired with Intel. Now, they actually recruited me, which is kind of a cool thing, right? That kind of gave me some good feeling to be headhunted by a company. Well, they recruited me. I started there. Now, I want to be clear. When I was hired, we only saw that first part, right? Because the future was not yet visible. And so when I was hired on, all I saw was a stock going up, up, up. Furthermore, what you don't see here is all the stock splits. Now, I won't go into detail about how stock splits work, but frankly, if you have, if you're, if you own stock, and it splits a bunch of times and it keeps going up, you're rich. It's just the way it works. And Intel pays its employees a lot in stock. So I was given this great big huge stock package when I was brought on board. And I calculated, I remember clearly, I was up at my in-law's cabin with a calculator. And I calculated that if the stock price continued on the way it would, the way it was over the last 10 years or so, then I would be able to retire at the age 55 as a multimillionaire. And that wasn't a crazy idea. People were retiring as millionaires during the tech boom, the dot-com boom. We'll come back to that in a moment. Every day. So this was not a strange thing, right? So I figure my calling an election was made sure financially. Well, what we didn't know at the time is that we were in the middle of the dot-com bubble, the dot-com boom, okay? Now, what is that? I know this is strange to hear, but there was a time where there was no internet. There was no internet. And yeah, it was really strange. You know, we were out there making tools with, you know, rocks and flint and so forth. So no internet at all. So the internet came on board. <laughs> right, Eldon? Right? By the way, you guys, you guys, um, Brittany, you remember that bubble? Wow. So you guys, if you choose to have kids one day, or, you know, whatever, you're going to be my age and you're going to go, you know what? There was a time when there was no AI and they're going to go, whoa, you're so old because you are living during the AI boom. We're going to come back to that. You are living during the AI boom. I was out working during the dot-com boom. And the idea of the dot-com boom is we were throwing money at anybody who had the word dot com in their name. OK, it was just massive. I'm not kidding. All right. You can Google this. You can research it. It's it's fascinating. This is how a boom works. A bubble, which is our topic today. You could put together a really half ass business plan put it in front, of vent, in front of venture capitalists, and they'd throw money at you. I mean, anything that had anything to do with the internet, they were throwing money at. And of course, as the internet grows and so forth, people need computers, people need servers. Well, Intel builds computers and servers. 
until the bubble bursts. And we're going to talk about that today. Well, it just so happens that the bubble burst about 13 minutes after I was hired. So for those of you playing at home, I did not retire a multimillionaire at 55. I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine. But, oh, that, that, would, that was ouch, right? So um, uh, back when it was all black and white, right? Uh, Brittany says, uh, I remember the early days of the internet. Companies gave out tons of free software. Yeah, and then they'd go out of business. Absolutely. Um, my mom got tons of software and CD. Yeah, CDs were coming every day, especially from AOL, America Online. AOL was just dumping CDs out there. Um, but then the web came along and put AOL out of business. Different story, but, but no, it's not a different story. It's part of that bust. We're going to talk about this today. So I'm going to show you another picture. There's another chart. Oh, for heaven's sake. There it is. Okay. And you guys have got more than one here. You've got a few already. Okay. So, um, this, as you can see, why is that not going right? There it is now. Okay. 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 As you can see, this is much more recent. 2008, 2009, and up to 2013. Um, many of you will remember this because your parents probably were talking about it. This was the housing bubble, the housing bubble of 2008, 2009. Now, to be fair, Utah got hit by the housing bubble, but one of the really good things about the Utah economy is that we are highly diversified. So when the rest of the country is riding high, we're doing okay. And when the rest of the country is in horrible recession, well, we're doing a little poorly. We are pretty darn steady. So the housing bubble, while it hurt Utah, it did not destroy Utah. Whereas from other states, especially like Arizona and Nevada and so forth, the housing bubble was awful. It, it destroyed fortunes. Which brings me to this chart. So, we got two red lines here. Well, the first red line, well, let me, let me give you a little background. Let me give you a little background. My father. My father owned a bed and breakfast in Telluride, Colorado. Now, if you're into skiing at all, um, let's see, it happened right now. Yeah, okay, we're going to talk about housing right now, Gardner. We are. We're going to talk about what is happening with it right now. So, good call. Um, my father owned a bed and breakfast in Telluride. If you're into skiing, you know Telluride, Colorado. It's kind of like Park City, Aspen, all these. It is a ski destination. And for 15 years, he owned a bed and breakfast there. And then he decided to just kind of peace out. So he sold the thing, sold it for about, oh, one and a half million or something. I don't know the particulars. Um, just around a million, I guess. So he sold it for a million. And then he took out a $700,000 loan and he decided, I am going to build a massive luxury home. I mean, we're talking a mansion in Telluride and there are lots of mansions in Telluride. I mean, many, many, many. You name a star, they probably own a place in Telluride, Colorado. Oprah moved in while he was there and a whole bunch of other stars and so forth. So he said, I'm going to take $1.7 million and I'm going to build a home. And he built it. He himself built it. Okay. Well, folks, that first line is when he started building the house. And that second red line is when he finished building the house. He sunk $1.7 million into the home, $700,000 of which was a loan. The first million was his. And by the time he finished the home, 
it wasn't worth but a fraction of what he put into it. He could not sell the home because he had spent more building it than he had, uh, than he could get out of it. He ended up having to sit on it for like five, six, seven years and pay property taxes on it each year, um, just waiting for the market to recover. And it never recovered. Yeah, Brittany, it was a serious yikes, serious yikes. Um, one day I'll tell you the story of my father later and so on and so forth. He, he, he passed a happy man, but he was for all intents, homeless. <laughs> I mean, I, if you want to hear his story later, I'll tell you his story. But the point is, it destroyed his fortune. Yeah, totally, totally destroyed his fortune. Um, and so these, these bubbles happen all the time, all the time. Built into the capitalist economic system is booms and busts, booms and busts. It's always boom and bust. It's not once in a while. It is a constant thing. Now, sometimes, most of the time, they're so small, you never really notice, or it's in an industry you don't really care about, or, or it doesn't affect the rest of the country that much. But the dot-com bubble affected the whole world. And the housing bubble affected the whole world. So, you know, it's it's something we have to learn to recognize and we're going to do that. Um, can we track booms and busts? That is an amazing question. So here's the thing when it comes to um, booms and busts, and I'm just going to go. Booms and busts are really easy to recognize in reverse because, you know, check this out, folks. It doesn't take an artist to recognize the fingerprint of a boom and bust, right? So it's not a question of can we recognize them? It's a question of can we time them right? So let me just give you an example. Let's bring this bad boy on over. Um, oh, let's get bigger. Okay. This is Bitcoin. Okay. Now, I when I started teaching, I would say that little one right there, you see that first little one right there? I'd say, gee, is this the boom? And then it came back down and people, oh, you know, and then it went much higher. And then, oh, was this the boom? And then it came down and then it went back up and this, the boom, and then it came down bad. And now it's back up. So this is a bubble. Okay. We, there, there's no doubt about that. What the question is, is when is it going to drop? And then when is it going to level out? So we're going to come back to Bitcoins here in a little bit. So bear with me on that one. Okay. Um, let's bring this back down. Let's see. Um, are booms and busts a capitalist problem or just an economic? It's capitalist because with free, and, and I will show you here in a moment. Oh, I'm getting lost on where all my stuff is. Um, I'll show you here in a moment why it's capitalist. As a matter of fact, I'll show you right now. Okay. So, um, and we meant to hit a, uh, hit a light bulb for that. Okay. Um, the reading talks about tulips. I don't care about tulips. It's why would we go back that far in history to study booms and busts when we have booms and busts everywhere? Okay. So, I already showed you that I lived through the dot-com boom and bust, and I lived through the housing bubble. Well, what I want to talk about is the comic book bubble. And I have lots of comic books that I can share and tell you about and so forth. It is the same principle. So, you know, when you are asking Gardner, can we track these things? 
what we're going to do is we are going to talk about the ingredients of a bubble. And as we learn how to recognize the ingredients, this is how we track. So this is what I mean, folks, when I say today we are talking about rock solid skills to help you today. Because whether you want to buy a home in the future, and we'll talk about homes, whether you want to start a business where you're doing online arbitrage with sneakers and so forth or any other thing or in cryptocurrency, um, you'll want to recognize these things. So we're going to talk about that. Um, oh, yeah. No, no, Brittany. The, wait till he's, yeah, the comic book bubble is, is a hilarious story. Um, yeah, movie industry. Okay. Okay. Oh, cool, Jay. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's come back over here. Um, so comic books, right? Let's talk about what makes a, a bubble a bubble. Comic books are for nerds and geeks and kids who are illiterate. At least that is how comic books were treated for a very long time, for a very long time. Um, and until 20 years ago, if you were to say that you were into, you know, I have my Batman ring here. This is a Batman ring. I know you can't really see it. But if you were to say you were into Batman or, or Thor and all that sort of stuff, you were a, a loser. All right. So for a long time, they were out of style. However, they started to kind of get cool. And they got cool for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, yes, Jay, very similar with playing cards, right? Um, let's see. Uh, traditional publishing, we'll talk about that. Yeah, um, playing cards are a great example of that. So comic books started to kind of get cool and, and so forth. I, you, you know, Tim Burton made the Batman movie, you know, way back before you were born. And that kind of rejuvenated interest in an adult comic book Batman image and so forth. Uh, Blade came out and then some other movies. And then, of course, you know, just things started to kind of get cool. And so certain comic books became status symbols. So let me show you what I mean. This book right here, this is uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 41. It is the first appearance of Rhino. Now, if you're into comic books, you'd go, oh, cool. First appearance of a, eh, albeit, but first appearance of a villain. Um, this comic book, this is X-Men number 12. Um, X-Men number 12, um, published a million years ago. This is the first appearance of Joggernaut, okay? So, and I have many, many others here. Um, I'll, well, I'll show you one more. This will mean more in the moment. This is Wildcats number one by Jim Lee, um, gold embossed cover signed by Jim Lee. We're going to talk more about this in a moment. So, as I say here, these are status symbols. I have many others around here that I could spend all day showing you. And in the right circles, that's kind of like, yeah, Tom, dang, you're old. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't buy those as a kid. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Um, you know, how much are they worth? You know, well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about all these things. Okay, so status symbols. Now, um, you know, having a um, having dot com stock was a status symbol. Owning crypto is kind of a status symbol. You know, I'm on the inside. I'm cool and hip and cutting edge. Um, in the case of the tulips, 
the tulips were a status symbol. That was the way that the Dutch demonstrated their wealth. That was bling. I work my ass off in the front yard and in the backyard to keep a beautiful yard because that's kind of, you know, uh, 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 suburban bling. There, that's the word I was looking for, suburban. Uh, well, they were doing the same thing with tulips and so forth. And yes, we have the tulip festival and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so status symbol. That's the first thing. The next thing is rarity. Okay, so when something is rare, it, of course, increases in value. Well, now let's talk about these comics for a moment. Um, let's just, I'll just pull out this one. Uh, the Spider-Man number 41, or like I say, we have X-Men number 12. They're rare. Now, they're not super duper rare, but they're fairly rare. The reason they're rare is if I were to take those out and show you, they are printed on the crappiest, most acid-laden newspaper print you've ever seen in your entire life. Comic books were meant to be purchased by 12-year-old kids with milk money and read and folded up and put in their back pockets and then taken to a fort, you know, under an aqueduct with other kids and they would trade comic books back and forth and then they would throw them away. That is what comic books were made to, how they were made to be used. They were not meant to be saved at all. And furthermore, they're only printing, you know, maybe a few hundred thousand or whatever. I mean, it's just for these snotty-nosed kids. Who cares? All right? So when it comes to the really old ones and the really unique ones, there just are not that many around. So now we have rarity coming into play. Um, scarcity has value. Exactly. Exactly right, Jay. Um, and uh, the PS Cray. Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> the guy knows his comic books. Okay. Next thing we have low supply, high demand. Okay. So things are starting to happen. Now, when it comes to the old comic books, I don't know if I can take this one down. Bear with me. This one I'm particularly proud of. Um, this is Vampirella Warren number one. So Vampirella number one. If you don't know Vampirella, you're, you can be forgiven. This is very niche. This is niche, but it's something that I was really into. Um, this is rare. This is rare, and it's, I don't know what it's worth right now. Somebody Google it, whatever. Vampirella number one, Warren. Um, and because again, they were, they were, you know, not made to be stuck around. Well, a lot of people really want this one. A lot of people really want it because it's niche and it's number one, first appearance of Vampirella, all that sort of stuff. So there's high demand for these unique comic books, high demand for them. And of course, a really low supply. Okay, now this is where we're going to start getting bubblish. In the 1990s, these publishers started to realize, you know what? People are really into rarity and, and they, they really like low supply. So what they started to do was first... Every issue that was published in the late 80s and early 90s, it was a first appearance of so-and-so, or it was the death of so-and-so, or it was, you know, it was the origin story of so-and-so. So just about every issue that came out had some level of rarity, right? Furthermore, they published all these comics, they would publish them with alternate covers, 
with gold embossed covers. They also had silver embossed covers. They would publish books, the same book, with five or six different covers to create the illusion of rarity. Okay? So with this illusion of rarity, but with high demand, these things flew off the shelves. More about that, okay? Which then brings me to low buy-in. Now, the nice thing about comic books is you don't have to be rich to get into it, right? If you wanted to wake up one day and say, I want to collect Rolex watches, you can, but that's not what I would call low buy-in. It, it takes some money to start collecting Rolex watches. Whereas for just a few bucks, you can pick up some rare, unique comic books. And you can start to build a collection, and it's kind of fun, and you, you know, search through all the boxes to find the missing books and so forth. And you're investing, you know, $10, $20 a week in comic books, and you're building up something kind of cool. So low buy-in. All right, this is where things are starting to get a little bubblish, though, because with publishers during the late 80s, early 90s, they are publishing, just pumping out all this garbage, and yet we are treating it like it's something unique and rare, okay? Um, I totally agree. I'd rather comic books over Rolex watches, but yeah, that's just me. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, we'll do guys. Okay. So, now we are fully in bubble territory with speculation. Speculation is where you have now moved from hobbyist to bubble contributor. Speculation is when you buy something with no intent at all in using it. The only reason you purchased it was to resell it at a profit. Now, in economics, there's a term for this. I'm not making this up. You can Google it. The term is the greater fool theory. The greater fool theory says when you purchase something, you are assuming that you will find somebody who is willing to pay more for it than you did. So you hold on to it and then you sell it at a profit. And that person is going to then look for the greater fool. All right. The idea is just don't be caught being the last fool with no greater fool. So speculation is when people are buying things with no intent of reading them, touching them, or anything. They are staying in their nice mylar. If you buy them in a mylar sheet and so forth, um, you're not even going to open that thing up. It's kind of like in collecting action figures. And yes, I have a basement full of comic books and action figures. The action figures are still in their packaging Mint, never touched, never opened. They were purchased merely as speculative commodities. Okay, my wife and I never planned on opening the things up. Actually, we would buy two of everything. One we would open up and put up on shelves, and the other we would leave in their boxes. So this is when things get really scary. Okay, because now people are buying tons of stuff just to hold on to it. So, for example, um, I would say, hey, if there's a new issue coming out, you know, with a new character, I would buy 10 of these new issues. Or this new comic book line coming out, and comic book number one, I would buy 20 of these number ones because I'm just going to put them in my basement and in 10 years pay for my kid's education, right? That is speculation. Um, this is firmly, firmly where crypto is right now. 
you do not buy crypto because, oh, you know what? It's just a great way to buy and sell things, you know, with crypto instead of money. No. When you buy crypto, you intend to hold on to it so that you can then sell the crypto. It's not so that you can get a pizza. So crypto, and, and crypto is real. This is not an anti-crypto thing. We're going to talk about that. It is firmly in the speculation, which is why crypto is going like this. Because when something is pure speculation, there, there's no robustness to the, uh, to the price and so forth. Um, okay, um, Jaden, your father collected Star Wars figurines. I love it. Um, let's see, Tyler... Um, I had that of my niece, right? Opened them up. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, I collected baseball cards and have like 220 of them. Yeah, right? And you thought you were going to be rich off them, or at least I did, right? Uh, um, I, you know, I got crypto just to see what would happen. I own crypto as well. Um, I do not think uh, anything, I mean, oh, my $200 worth. I don't really get into it. But I, I feel like if I'm going to teach it and talk about it, I should learn how it works. And so, yeah, yeah, I've got it too. So that's speculation, though. This is now dangerous territory, really dangerous. Okay, next one. Stockpiling. Now we are in trouble. Sp We've got all these people, like me, who are out there buying 10, 20, 30 issues of this one particular comic book whenever it comes out, and we're not even opening it. Same with action figures. We just put them in mylar sheets, put them in boxes, put them in the basement, and that's it. Which means all over America in the early 1990s, there are boxes upon boxes upon boxes of comic books in everybody's basement. In my basement, you know, if you watched my video on this, it, uh, I, have, I have a lot of comic books. So what's the problem with stockpiling? Well, because it gives the illusion of rarity. If everybody's just putting them in boxes down in their basement and there are none on the market, then it drives up the price. Not because it's truly rare, but because there are just none on the market. So now, for example, um, I actually have two of these uh, gold embossed alternate cover uh, Wildcats number one signed by Jim Lee. There was a time where this thing was worth $300. Not because it was worth $300, but because you couldn't find any on the market. Nobody would sell them. Nobody was putting them up on eBay and so on and so forth. We're going to come back to that. And so there was a time that that was a really valuable book. All right. Um, hoarding it all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A scrapper. <laughs> All right, so we are now stockpiling. We are also buying on futures. Now, here is a super, super, super def simple definition of futures as it applied to the comic book industry. Real futures are much more complicated, but you'll get the idea. We would hear that Superman is going to die. All right, death of Superman. And so what people would do is say, listen, I want 100 issues of the death of Superman. Also, Superman got married. Same sort of thing happened there. But the death of Superman was the number one published graphic novel. I think it still is the number one published graphic novel, meaning they printed like three million or six million of these things. And people would say, I want a hundred issues. I want a hundred. And so they would they would promise to buy 100 issues when they came in. So that means that the publishers are publishing a ton of them. 
and the the retailers are bringing them all in because all these people promised to buy them. Well, now this is a problem because what happens if when they come out, you kind of decide, I'm not going to buy them after all. Those things become really worthless really fast. All right. Now, no regulation. This is a big issue right now with crypto. All right. I don't have to tell you what's happening in the crypto world. It's it's a wild, wild west. And a lot of people are doing a lot of sketchy things and going to jail. There's not a lot of regulation. Not a whole lot here I can share with comic books. However, here is the final one. Somebody somewhere wakes up one morning, stretches, mm, makes a cup of coffee, sits there at the window, looking out the window and goes, you know what? I kind of don't know that my comic book collection can go up in value much more than this. As a matter of fact, I think it's kind of overvalued. I think I'm going to start selling. Well, now people buy and sell all the time. But, uh, oh, my va- my Vampirella book there, Vampy. Where's Vampy? Where's my Vampy book? Okay, $1,200. Not too shabby. Um, somebody somewhere is going to say, I'm going to sell. And they start selling. And other people notice, oh, look, the price of my Vampirella went down from $1,200 to 1150 I probably ought to sell. Maybe, maybe we found the top. And more and more people start to sell. And then at a certain point, all hell breaks loose. There is a panic. And everybody runs down to their basement, pulls up all the comic books, and just starts flooding the market with all of these issues. Issues that six months ago were rare and you couldn't get a hold of. But now that the bubble has burst, everybody is flooding, flooding the market. And so now you can buy Death of Superman for 13 cents because it's worthless. This book here that um, was once worth, um, what, 300 bucks or so? Is probably a $15 book now. Um, Vampirella was probably worth about 40000 at one time. It, this, is, this is how a bubble bursts. Because now it's all coming around. Big turnaround from 50 cents. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I didn't buy it for 50 cents. But I didn't buy it for 1200 either. Um, yeah, GameStop is a great example. Although that one was a manufactured one. Yeah, those guys were not dummies. They knew what they were doing. Um, So, with the market flooded, everything falls out. Everything falls out. So, let's talk about what this means for for certain industries and so forth. Um, Let me come on over here. So, let's talk. um, Let me make a few things clear. Um, tulips were a bubble. Tulips are still around and they're still expensive. Um, dot com stock was a bubble. Dot com companies are still around and they're still expensive. Homes were a bubble. Homes are still around and they're still expensive. And comic books were a bubble. They're still around and they're still expensive. Just because it goes up and then goes down doesn't mean it's worthless. Therefore, crypto, bubble, absolutely, it's a bubble. Nobody, nobody, you know, argues that. And it'll still have a life going forward. But where it is, nobody knows yet. Okay. And we are now going to see a bubble with AI stock. So real quick, somebody, you know, if you're curious, well, hell, I'll do it right now. Um, I'll show you NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA, let's see, over the last five years. Okay, Um, let's come back over here. 
This is NVIDIA stock price. NVIDIA makes, you know, graphic chips and so forth. So if you're into gaming, you have NVIDIA, you know, graphic chips and so on. But they also make AI chips. And you notice their stock price is going crazy. This is a bubble. This is normal. Bubbles are not a strange disease or anything. It's normal. Now, where is the top? No one knows. Um, you'd have to kind of do a test to see how are people using this stock? Are they, you know, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of other stocks that you can be looking at for um, um, AI. But the point is we're in an AI bubble. But there's nothing wrong with that. Next thing I want to point out is let's talk housing because this is something that matters to you guys. Um, at some point, you're going to want to buy a home and you are looking around going, holy hell, they're expensive. OK. Um, and if we look at, let's see, um, let's see, housing and cost. Um, or no. Nah, I'm pulling up. I did. I should have had it all ready and everything. Um, real quick, Jay, uh, living large, if you so, put some bags in the stock about 10 years ago, right? So now, Jay, here's one of my points about 10 years ago. And I actually have a video about this. I contend that you are always in the right place at the right time to make a fortune. It's not a question of being in the right place at the right time. You're always in the right place at the right time. The question is, do you recognize the trend and do you have the resources to exploit it? That's the tough thing. So, I have been on this earth 50 years, and I've been at the right place at the right time easily a dozen times, but I did not see the trend, and I didn't have the resources to exploit it. Um, and you are going to be on this earth for another 100 years, and you're going to be in the right place at the right time 20 times, and you're in the right place, right time, right now, with AI and VR and IR, you are in the right place at the right time. The question is, do you know what to do and do you have the resources to exploit it? That's the tough thing. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, insufficient funds. You get it. You get it. Okay. Um, all right. Homes. Let me explain to you the difference. And when I say difference, I'm not saying there isn't a bubble but there is a difference, okay? Let me explain the difference between the housing market right now and the housing market before, all right? First of all, remember what I said when it comes to um, bubbles, one of the ingredients is low buy-in. Back during the housing bubble, you could buy a home with low income, poor credit rating, and no down payment. That's about as low of a buy-in as you could get. And trust me, I know, and I'm privileged, I get this, but when my wife and I bought our first home, our income was pretty darn low, our credit rating was not good, and we were able to scratch together about a 5% down payment is all. And so really low buy-in. There is no low buy-in today. No low buy-in at all. Okay. So that ingredient is not there. Another ingredient that is not as strong today is... Remember, stockpiling and speculation. Speculation leads to stockpiling. During the housing bubble that I lived in, flipping homes was all the rage. 
everybody was flipping homes. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry was out there buying a home. They'd repaint it and then resell it and call it a flip. And every show on TV was about flipping homes. And so a lot of people were buying two or three or four homes to flip them and sit on them, right? So they buy two or three or four homes, fix them up, and then just sit on them and wait for the market to go up and I'll sell them in six months. So the the amount of homes out there was artificially low because people were buying homes with low buy-in. They were not living in them, so it was speculation. And then they were stockpiling them, waiting to sell them in six to nine months so they could get rich. That is not happening as much today. Nowhere near as much today, in fact. In fact, today, um, for a whole variety of reasons, it is cheaper to buy a new new, brand new home built for you than it is to buy an old home for a whole variety of reasons. I won't go into it, but if you're looking at buying a home, you should have a home built for you in Harriman. You should not buy a 50-year-old home in Sandy. That's too expensive. New is cheaper. Funny how that works. So again, I don't want to say don't don't come back to this video in six years when the housing market has fallen apart and say, Lon said there was no bubble. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there are two ingredients, three ingredients that are not quite as strong as they were before. Okay. So that brings us over. Ah, let's come on over here. I know I pushed, I pushed the wrong button again. That brings us to romance of a busy broker. Um, let's go ahead and stretch for a minute and do our quick break. This is going to be a little bit of a different lecture. I'll even give you the option to bail, but give me a second. Let me explain. But then again, well, you could always come back and rewatch the end where I explain what we're doing at the end uh, for the next few weeks. But Point is, I'm going to have some fun. Not that I don't have fun all the way around. So let's get up and stretch. Every time I stretch, I've got this sound blanket up here. You can't see it. That's the whole point. But I've got the sound blanket, and I always wonder, how much dust is that thing collecting? It's going to be scary to take that down one day. Um, I'm in a teeny tiny little bedroom that I've converted into a studio, and oh, Works fine for my purposes, but it's not a purpose-built studio. I've had to kind of jerry-rig a lot of things. Um, yeah, blind to the right trend and insufficient funds, Christina. You are so right. Oh, my gosh. So right. I feel the same way. I feel the same way. Okay. If you got your stretch on, let me go ahead and tell you how we're going to do this. Romance of a Busy Broker by O. Henry. All right. So this is kind of a famous little short story. If you read it, great. If you didn't, I'm going to give you the cliff note version. Um, famous little short story because of what I call an M. Night Shyamalan ending. All right. It has this little ending that's kind of like, oh, wow, okay, the aliens were among us the whole time. Uh, not that any N. Might Shyamalan movie did that, but any case, point is, has this twist ending. It's a hokey, schlocky twist ending, but it's one we're going to build on. Here's the story. There's a busy broker, right? He's, I don't know what he brokes, but he's a broker. And uh, he's all busy and so forth. And he works with a business partner there at his office and a stenographer. I forget their names. I don't need their names. That's not important. So the busy broker comes on into work one day and, and he's busy, busy, busy. And he gets right to work and so forth. And his business partner comes in and says, hey, um, 
So this afternoon, the employment agency is sending over some stenographers for us to interview to replace our current stenographer. And the broker's like, okay, whatever, whatever. I'm, I'm busy. I'm talking on the phone. I'm, I'm making deals. Leave me alone. So the, the partner heads out. And then at one point, the, the broker is like, why are, we, what, why are we interviewing stenographers? We've got this one stenographer. She's fantastic. And at that moment, the stenographer walks in, and she's looking good, and she's smiling, kind of glowing. And she looks at the broker, kind of says, good morning, sir, and winks and goes on into her office. And he's like, she's really a good stenographer. Why are we? I'm confused. So he goes on to his partner's office and says, hey, cancel those interviews. We don't need to interview any new stenographers. And the partner's like, dude, are you serious? He's like, yeah, I don't understand why we're doing this in the first place. We're fine. We don't need a new stenographer. Cancel. He's like, all right, man, you're the boss. So he gets to work on that. So the broker goes back to his desk and he's he's kind of, you know, he's making his, filling out his forms, making his phone calls. But all the while, he's kind of stewing on this. And he's like, why would we, she's really good. I mean, she's a really good stenographer. In fact, I really like her a lot. I mean, I like her a lot. So he's like, okay. I'm going to just take care of this. I'm going to go in. I've been thinking about this for a while. And so he goes into the stenographer and he says, hey, listen, I've got, I've got somebody on the phone. I've got a meeting here in two minutes and I've got all this paperwork to do. So I'm, I'm busy, but I need to ask you something real quick. I know I haven't been able to court you properly and so forth, but you know, it, I'm, hang on, I'll be there in a minute. I wanted to ask if you would marry me. Now, I know this is out of the blue, and I've been thinking about it a while. I should have come to you sooner, but I have it. I'm really busy, though, so chop, chop. I, I kind of need an answer. And the stenographer, she kind of looks a little heartbroken at first, and then she smiles. And she says, I kind of figured something like this would happen. We were married last night at the church on the corner. There's your M. Night Shyamalan ending. They were already married. They had just gotten married. But he was so busy that he forgot. Oh, wow. Okay. But now here's the thing, folks. As hokey as that story is, there's more than a grain of truth to it. And this is where I am going to go on one of my rants, and I want to, I really want to impress something upon you. Um, you're about to go out into the workforce. You're about to go out into the workforce. You want to build a, a career. You want to get financial security. You want to thrive in your job. You want to build a life. Um, you, your partners, your friends, your family, whomever. And, um, and I'm here to tell you, it's a big, mean, scary world out there. And one of the big, mean, scary boogeymen of the world out there are your employers. All right. Um, I'm, I'm speaking about this both as somebody who has experienced this, somebody who has close friends who are experiencing this, and as somebody who did his PhD dissertation on this topic. Okay. So I want to spend a few minutes to talk about eight tools the system uses to control and overwork you. Now, you may be in a state in your career right now where you're like, I haven't, I mean, I just leave, I clock out and I'm done. But I'm telling you, when you start really wanting to build a career, these are the mechanisms that employers use to control you. And I want you to be aware of them. Now, many of them we've already talked about in this class, such as the profit motive. You always want more. And 
And it's not just more money. You want more, more. You want more money. You want more autonomy. You want more um, uh, position in the company. You want more prestige. Uh, you want more independence. You want more influence. You want more, 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 more in a career. And to get this more, you have to work more. You have to work harder. You have to work longer. You have to work smarter. And yet, remember, one of the aspects of the profit motive is it is never enough. We are perpetually dissatisfied in our current state. And what do we do in this world when we are dissatisfied in our current state? We take action to ameliorate, to change our current state. But since we are always in our current state, we are always dissatisfied. Employers know this, and they're always promising you more. Hey, if things go really well this next year, there might be a promotion in it for you. So we'll be watching you closely. Hey, you know what? Uh, profits aren't quite where we wanted them to be. We have one more year to get profits up to where we want them for this special bonus. So we're going to be watching profits. Um, hey, you know what? There's this work assignment you have been kind of looking at. You're on the short list for it. They're always telling you the things that are out there that you want to cause you to work for it. Furthermore, they're more than happy to give you things that give you the illusion of progression. You're a, you're a marketing specialist. Congratulations. You are now a senior marketing specialist. And now you get the prestige of being a senior marketing specialist. But, and with that comes additional responsibility and, and so on and so forth. Is there more pay? We're going to see about that next year. It's not in budget this year. But this year, you get the senior and you get the, the additional responsibility so you can feel good that you're progressing in your career. This is just one of a million things that they do to trigger this profit motive. Um, yeah, a full higher raise after attempting or promotion, 15 cents, right? Yeah. Then we have the Protestant work ethic and the, 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 our view of idleness, okay? Now, once again, you know about this because we talked about it in our class, but now I want to put it in real terms. Capitalism supposedly um, venerates, esteems, drives after efficiency. Efficiency is doing more with less. Okay. But that's not how human beings work. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say we've got two people. We've got Linda and Bob. All right. Linda is really, really efficient. She's really good. In fact, she's so good that she makes it look easy. And she probably produces about 10% more than Bob, who we're going to talk about in a moment. It's a nine to five job, but she comes in at 9.15, 9.30. And she gets to work, but she also hangs around at the water cooler a lot. She takes a long lunch and she's talking with others. And she leaves at 4.45 or so, and on Fridays, often leaves at 4. But she is so good and so efficient that almost without you noticing, she can produce 10% more than anyone else. Okay, that's Linda. Now let's talk about Bob. Bob struggles. He's, he's not as efficient. He knows his job. He knows what to do. And he still produces. But he has to work his ass off to do it. It's a nine to five job, but he often shows up at like 7.30, 7.45. 
and he's always haggard, and he eats his lunch at his desk, and he'll, while others are leaving at 5, he leaves at 5.30 or 6, sometimes 6.30, um, and he's always hectic, always moving, always doing things. Now, he gets his job done, right? He, he meets the expectations, but he's frantic, but he's there all day long and sometimes works weekends. Now, when it comes time to promote someone, who are they going to promote? Well, if you're saying Linda because she's so good and efficient, I've got really bad news for you. Because even though she's producing, she is perceived as idle, as lazy, as she's not working hard because she makes it look easy. But that's not what they're thinking. They don't say she's so good, she makes it look easy. They're saying she doesn't take this seriously. She's not a company person. Whereas Bob is a company man. This guy freaking lives here and he's always on the phone and he's always working and he's always churning. That guy has a future here. Well, you're going to learn this. You are going to learn this in the workplace. And you are going to be very tempted to over-engineer processes and to make things look much more complicated than they really are. Because if they look at you and say, you make it look easy, you're telling them you are replaceable. Whereas if they look at you and you are just frazzled and you don't even understand what the person is doing and and it's all so complicated and thank goodness they're here, they are indispensable. I'm telling you, this is the way it works, okay? Um, a, A corporate employee. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Christina. Um, Bob is doing more, so the business sees him doing more for um, even though it's less. Exactly. He's not efficient. All right. He is not getting the output, greater output for less input. Um, David, uh, the problem is uh, a lot of corporations expect people to go above and beyond, right, to meet expectations. Exactly, exactly. Linda will learn to work for herself and Bob will burn out. Yeah. (laughs) So I worked in this sphere for 20 years and I was able to escape. And now I kind of just do my own thing. All right, let's keep going. Next one, we want to have it all. And in order to have it all, we need to work our asses off. So this is something that we know intellectually, but we don't accept it in our hearts. Um, We want a great career. We want lots of vacation time. We want to have a thriving family, and I want to go to all my kids' soccer games. And I want to raise my kids, but I also want to have a career, and I want to start this whole business, and I want to have, uh, I want to do this hobby of mine, and I want to have personal time. We want to have it all. And if you watch YouTube, and you're on YouTube right now, so I guess you watch YouTube, the grind culture thing is all over the place. You know, you got to work your ass off. You got to, you know, manage your time, rise and grind, hustle culture, all that sort of stuff, because we want to have it all. Well, you can't. You can't. Um, there's only 24 hours in a day. You only have so much energy and cognitive resources to focus. You can't have it all. You have to make trade offs. But the companies don't communicate this to you. They're just throwing up opportunities, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Now, I want to be clear. I want to talk to both men and women here. Ladies, you get this worse than the men do. Because society loves to tell you that you can be a full-time mother and a full-time CEO at the same time. 
You know you can't do that. I know you can't do that. Everybody knows. But if you look at the rhetoric out there, it's you should be able to do both. And and it's hard. I mean, and I mean, I we could if if you want to talk sometime about pay, you know, disparages, you know, disparagements and pay and why women aren't paid as much as men and how that's wrong and what men can do to make this better and so forth. Men, I challenge you. If you choose to have a family, really make sure that you sit down and share the duties equal 50-50. It will actually work to your financial advantage as a family if you share, level load the work 50-50, taking care of the kids, working, taking care of the house, running the errands, so on and so forth. The num- uh, I won't go into the numbers right now, but that's where the strength is. Um, you'll also learn that being a stay-at-home parent is I can't say the word. It is effing hard. Okay. We're actually going to talk about that more here in a moment. Okay. Adriana. Yeah. Yeah. You get it. Right. David, you get it. Yeah. David, my wife uh, said her, um, her dad used to say, you can have anything you want, but not everything you want. Yes. Oh, I like the way you put it. And yes, taxing. Christina, it doesn't even begin to explain. So I have experience in this area. I have been the stay-at-home parent. And, um, oh my gosh, I just want to sit down with you guys sometime and tell you these stories because you can... (laughs) The, The problem, when you're young, and I was young once, you hear all this stuff from old men. And you go, yeah, 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 old man, whatever. And then when you're the old man, you're like, oh, I have so much to share. I can warn you about all this stuff. And you're surrounded by people like me going, yeah, 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 old man, whatever. I get it. I truly get it. Okay, let's keep going. Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out drives us in so many things. And companies will leverage this. Okay. Hey, there's this big project coming up. Uh, We're kind of, you know, are you interested in doing that? Or, hey, we have this sort of side project over here. It'll require you to work some weekends, but it's high visibility to the vice president and she wants to see what you can do and so forth. Or, hey, you know, we have this thing happening over here where we're standing up a new business in in Costa Rica. Would you like to move to Costa Rica and kind of uh, help stand up that business and so forth? We want want to be a part of these because that's where opportunity is. Opportunity doesn't knock, or at least you need to be able to answer it when it does knock. You got to go out and look for it. And so companies will always put these things out here, which brings me to the next one. And actually these, I don't like the order. So I'm going to go back. We're going to do this one. It is so hard to say no, especially at work. All right. Companies, here's something that you really need to take the time, I'm begging you, and internalize this truth. People will always ask for more. Companies will ask for more. Your volunteer groups will ask for more. Your churches, synagogues, and mosques will ask for more. Your family will ask for more. Everybody wants a part of you, but there's only so much of you. But you don't want to say no. It's the the Billie Eilish line, everybody wants something from me now, and I don't want to let them down. Um. And this is especially true at work. Work will always ask for more. And they will only stop when you either say no more or you burn out and leave. Okay? So learning how to say no to a project is really important and really difficult because 
That's where the opportunities are. Every time you say no, you get this feeling that you're saying no to an opportunity. Furthermore, you get this feeling like you've just damaged your career because you told your boss no, or you told a customer no. Really tough. Okay, next one. The irony of wealth. Okay, here's the irony of wealth. The wealthier you are, the more expensive it is to maintain that wealth. So I'll give you an example. Um, I have a home and I have a yard. Nice. That's a, that's a level of wealth that I have. But I'm telling you, maintaining a home and maintaining a yard is very expensive and very time consuming. If I did not have a home, it would not be expensive and time consuming to maintain that home. Now, I'm not saying that therefore I shouldn't have a home. No, I want my home. But now what about people who say, I'd really like to have a second home. I'd love to have a vacation home. I'd love to have a cabin. Okay, now you've just doubled the time and money to maintain it. Um, a second car. I'll give you an example on the cars. My father passed away and uh, I got his truck. It's a nice truck. It's out the side of my house. I can't drive it because I can't afford the insurance. I've already got two cars and actually three I pay for my kids. The point is, I can't take on another insurance payment. Therefore, I have a very valuable asset. I have wealth, but it is too expensive for me to use that wealth. So the wealthier you are, the more you have to work to maintain that wealth. And companies use this. Okay, we're almost there. Two more. Two more. And then we're done. Um, work is a great place to hide. Now, we have a few folks with us who are what we would call non-traditional students, meaning you're old, <laughs> like me. Nobody's old like me. But the point is, we have some non-traditional students. So I want to call that out as I say what I'm about to say. All you young folks out there, You've gone through rough times. I get that. Nobody knows you and what you have experienced and what, what you've had to work through and the traumas and so forth in your life. I get that. I respect that. I, you should be afforded the dignity of somebody who is growing and learning and going through tough times. That said, it's nothing compared to what you're going to experience over the next 70 years. You are going to go through such trauma, such difficult times, such horrible trials. You're going to be fine. You're going to get through it because you're badass and you're going to be able to work your way through it. But I'm telling you, some of them are going to be really, really rough. And work is a great place to hide from your troubles. Because check this out. At work, you know your position. You know who you report to. You know who reports to you. You know what your role and responsibility is. You know what the expectations are. You have the expertise to do what you need to do. You have the tools and resources to do what you have to do. Work is a whole set of known quantities. There ain't nothing known about family. For example, you're going to, I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience. My wife and I have gone through highly significant family trauma. And during those times, I did not know 
what my role and responsibility was. I don't know how to be a parent. I don't know how to deal with this sort of thing. I don't know the legal systems. I don't know the social systems. I don't know this. I don't know. And, and, and everything is falling apart. And work is a great place to hide during those times because at work, you know what the score is. At home, it's, it's trauma. I'm just warning you. And here's the last one. You've been so good dealing with this. We like it. We like being overly busy at work. Now, why is that? Well, because as I say here, we brag about how busy we are, waving our self-perceived martyrdom syndrome for all to see and admire. We attach our sense of self-worth to our title and to our salary and to the prestige that these things give. Remember, we want to be perceived as, as successful. We want to be perceived as competent. We want to be perceived as someone of value. And so we tell people, oh, I'm so busy. I'm so behind on my grading. And I have so many committee meetings to go to. And I have all this work to do. That's us saying, look how important and successful I am. I am so important that I need to be on every committee. And I am so successful that I have all this happening and so on and so forth. So while we pretend we are complaining, we're not complaining. We're saying, I am the bomb. And people feed that. People feed that. Now, Frank Root, oh, I cannot tell you what level of bullshit I think that is. But I'm telling you, that stuff, this is the person who is working like a chicken with their head cut off for 60 hours a week, and everybody is going, wow, we got to promote that person because they are just really killing it. And that person loves being that person. I've met these people. I've been these people. Okay. Last thought. Just want to, and this is when it comes to work. If you don't manage your time and energy in pursuit of your own goals, others will manage it in pursuit of theirs. You have time. You have energy. If you don't know how to apply that time and energy to your own goals and vision in life, others called employers will take that time and energy that you have and apply it to their goals in their corporation. Companies are looking for time and energy. That's what they want. And they will take as much time and energy as you're willing to give. And if you don't have a vision for your future and your own personal goals, then good news, there's a market for your time and energy. Employers. Eldon. <laughs> I've been these people, Eldon. So just kidding. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. All right, folks. You have done it. You have totally rocked. I'm going to take this one out of the way for a moment. You've crushed this semester. Um, of course, you have one more assignment here to do based on this lecture here. So what are we going to do going forward? Well, um, I think next week what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a Zoom meeting where we can do a final review. We can review the final. I'm going to totally set you up for success. It is a comprehensive final, meaning it goes back to the beginning of the semester. And so if you're going, oh, my holy hell, I can't remember anything from four weeks ago, let alone four months ago, I get it, okay? So we're going to do a final review over Zoom. Um, after that, I might set up a writing lab. So if you need help on your papers or anything like that, I can help you out. But finally, I'm thinking about putting together, um, uh, and all of these are optional. If you're like, I don't need a final review, you don't need to come to the final review. If you don't want to come to a writing lab, you don't have to come to a writing lab. 
I'm thinking of putting together a live stream for AI, how to use AI. I've been working with others and so forth to figure out some great tools, tips and tricks for AI. That will probably be our last one and I'll probably do it on live stream. But again, this is not part of class. This is all optional. In terms of class, you're done. You've, you've crushed it. Come back for the final review, but yeah, you're good. So just so you know, that's what's coming in the future. I'll, I'll let you know when, in the announcements and email what we're doing. Um, yeah, Tyler, I can barely remember last week. It's true. It's true. I get it. I get it. So with that, as always, I'm going to be sticking around if you have any comments or questions or if you need any clarification on anything, let me know. Otherwise, I will be communicating with you through Canvas. And um, thank you for a great semester. Thank you for really making this live stream something exciting and fun. I, I deeply appreciate that because I know how hard it is on your side to stay engaged with this. So yeah, Gardner, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, we will see you all in the future. Stay connected. Stay in unlock, uh, not unlock. That was my old company. Stay in nutshell brainery. Don't be a stranger. Jamie, we'll see you later. Rebecca, you betcha. Tyler, we'll see ya. Thank you. Christina, I appreciate it. And uh, David, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we're done with the live streams, David. I will send you an email telling you what we're doing going forward. We're going to do a final review over Zoom, but you'll get all the information over email and in the announcements. So don't worry. It's okay that your internet crapped out. We'll see you, Eldon, Jay, Tom. Tom or Thomas? I think it's just Tom. <laughs> we'll see you, Jaden. We'll see you, David. Oh, good. Cool, Jay. It'll be great to see just Tom. Good, Tom. Thank you for letting me know. Um, and Jay, we'll see you during the summer then. That's awesome. All right. Well, I see people dropping off. I don't see any last questions or comments or anything. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off and we'll see you all again later. Bye-bye.